Hi, uh, we're at the end of our Flourishing Church series today. 12 weeks of it. I uh, hope it's been helpful to us all. And I hope that you've noticed how each of these last four, as we've talked about mission, are all integrated with one another. Community engagement, evangelism, justice, and today, partnerships. Both the Old and the New Testament provide examples of God's call, uh, God's people being called to loyalty to Him, but not with a kind of fortress mentality, uh, as if to have any contact with a, a pagan person is to be contaminated, a bit like being contaminated by COVID. Uh, people did have liaisons with other people. For instance, Abraham in Genesis was pursuing God's calling. But at times he had liaisons with people like Abimelech uh, and others too. Joseph was led to Egypt and served God's purposes there, but he even married an Egyptian when he was there. There's other examples, but the famous passage of Jeremiah 29 I think is very instructive for us today. Jeremiah 29, chapter, uh, verse 4 says, This is what the Lord, of heavens, uh, the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. The Babylonian superpower, so this is the background to all of that. Uh, this is a, a part of a letter Jeremiah the prophet wrote to the exiles. The background was, uh, it's, it was pretty political. Babylon was the big superpower and the Israelites were trying to loose themselves and from, from the shackles of Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah was saying to them, don't do that because it was God's judgment on the people that Babylon was, was, was now in control of them because they had been unfaithful to God. Jeremiah was trying to say, submit this is God's will for you. But there were others who were protesting and were rebelling against that to their own detriment. So Jeremiah was saying, make the best of your life. Live as normally as you can. Seek the welfare of the city where you live. God calls his people to accept reality and live like those who believe that they serve the God of the universe. I want to read this amazing quote from Jeff Maddox. The words welfare, well-being, peace and prosperity are all derived from the one Hebrew word shalom. This word is so wonderfully spacious it holds all our best God-given hopes for healing salvation, reconciliation, justice, and renewal. There is no better word to describe God's plans for the whole cosmos, the whole cosmos being a Greek word to describe the whole world, but everything in the world, the whole of creation. This is the mission of God and partnership is essential. God's people were called to live life in Babylon. Does it mean they had to accept the values and the culture of Babylon? No, but they had to grapple with it. In a secular world, which sometimes does seem like Babylon to us, God calls us to seek the shalom of the people around us. Jesus did the same. Remember last week we were looking at um, Jesus' mission in Luke chapter 4, and at the end of it, the, uh, the people actually tried to kill him, people from his own town. Why did that happen? Because while Jesus, Jesus had preached to them, and then while he was talking, 
he referred to two examples of Elijah and Elisha, the prophets in the Old Testament, and how they went to help widows, both of them from foreign countries who were the enemies of Israel, one from Sidon and one from Syria. And because of that, the people were angry at Jesus. They were offended. It's hard to escape, though, what Jesus was, 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 getting, or was uh, trying to say when, he's, when he said that. And to make it even more explicit, he said that we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecuted us. God calls people into partnership with those who don't always hold to his ways. Now, we have a great example of, of this here. Uh, we have diff various examples. The op shop um, had a meeting during the week a few days ago, and uh, it was great to see all the op shop volunteers. Now, as you know, some of those volunteers are not from the church, but for a number of years have been working beautifully in partnership with us to achieve the purposes for our op shop. And um, one of the really good things that happened is that Jeanette um, introduced it. We had a bit of a laugh. And then Jeanette shared a, a little bit about how God had been working in her life during COVID. So that was a fantastic example of how, as we do partnership, we have the opportunity to share our faith and our lives. And good on you, Jeanette, for the way you did that. Another partnership that we've had is with the Pentland Primary School, which we've actually been doing Kids Hope for uh, nine years. And I interviewed Andrew um, Harrison, the principal of Pentland, and we're going to see that now. Because of this theme of partnerships we're looking at uh, with different um, groups in the community, uh, we just wanted to uh, ask, or oh, I wanted to ask you about what you feel has been the value or some of the, the value of uh, Kids Hope running in your school? Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, great to have you out at Pentland Primary School today. Always good Pleasure. to have a chat. Um, Kids Hope has been an amazing um, partnership and it's been an amazing program to have implemented together. Um, but I think before we talk about um, Kids Hope, I'd really like to just share that the, the culture at, at Pentland uh, is a really wonderful one. We've got a, a really strong mm -hmm. sense of community and we've always believed at Pentland that students uh, shouldn't suffer the sins of their parents. So um, as a teacher and a principal, I've always firmly believed that. And uh, we do know as, uh, as a school that uh, children have a, a range of different circumstances that make up their, their, their lives at home and their lives at school. And, uh, and we know absolutely that as soon as a, a student walks through the gate at Pentland, that we can absolutely make a difference. And we've got five hours of tuition or about seven hours of each of their days to, to make a positive difference in their life. Um, we know as, uh, as teachers and educators that teachers need to know exactly where their students are academically, socially and their, and their circumstances at home. And, uh, and then we 100% need to know exactly what we need to do next. And so, so that, that's a really important part of the culture of Pentland and the way we go about student learning. Um, we, I think a challenge for leadership teams is to harness uh, all available resources uh, to make sure that, that students continue to develop and, uh, and learn and to become the best they can actually be and to, to make sure that the learning continues for that child. So, um, so having said that, um, Kids Hope has been just an amazing initiative at our school because it, is, it has been one of those crucial partnerships. And we, we believe that uh, relationships at all level is the key. So the homeschool relationship, relationships with students and, and actively engaging students and relationship and partnerships with community groups, with um, the, the local police, um, the shire, um, churches, anyone who we can make a, 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 you know, a partnership with who will contribute positively to student outcomes, um, we're, we're interested in that and, uh, and we're committed to it. And as you said, Jeremy, 
we've been uh, on the journey now with Kids Hope for, you know, since 2012. And that has been a, a fantastic journey that has got bigger and better and stronger each year. Um, we have seen um, the absolute fruits of that partnership, particularly in our student data. So we've been, we track our students uh, fairly comprehensively and we have tracked the students that have been involved in Kids Hope. And not only have we seen uh, continued academic progression, but we've also seen socially that those students have uh, continued to grow and continue to develop their, their social skills and, and their ability to in, engage with others, engage in their learning. So we have, um, we have a data set that is uh, referred to as Attitudes to School Survey. So each year we give our students from grades four to six a survey um, around their the questions and, and, um, and sort of gives us a, a bit of an indication of where they are in terms of their relationship with each other and relationships with their teachers and how, how connected they are to school and, and each other. And we can see in that data that the students that have been involved in Kids Hope are, are up there with, uh, you know, with the top 10% of, of the data that we get from our other students. So, um, so that's really, really impressive, really, mm. really positive for us. And, it, and that is one little marker that helps us continue to, um, you know, to, to support the, the partnership that we have um, with Kids Hope. And, and why should schools um, connect with churches and, and, uh, and put, a, put time and effort into a, developing a partnership with churches? Well, we firmly believe that, um, you know, we have seen and experienced um, working with people that have similar values and a similar commitment to not only our school community, but the staff and the students at Pentland Primary School. We know that working with uh, people connected to the church, we know that they're committed we know that they're 100% on board and, uh, and they're, they're working with us for exactly the, the right reasons. And, um, and you know, we've, we've actually seen the results. We've seen that the fruits of everybody's labour. And, mm. um, and, and it, it, it's been a great outcome. So mm. we, we look forward to the, the 10th year anniversary and, and beyond. That's <laughs> yeah, well, well, so are we, Andrew. And God led us to both uh, the ministries of Kids Hope and also the op shop. And uh, to see the dedication of teachers uh, at Pentland Primary, uh, and I know some of you who are parents see this in your own schools too, but week in, week out, we see that teachers are dedicated and they really do care for the, the children. But uh, you heard in the video that Andrew was really uh, just impressed with all the mentors from the church too and how they interact with the children. So it's a two-way thing. Uh, in the op shop, I'm sure that those of you who got to know the op shop volunteers, uh, those other volunteers from the church who got to know the others, uh, would, would know that it's not just them that's learning from us. We are learning from them too. And God uses us together and our interactions to learn from each other. And that is true partnership. Partnerships have enriched us. But they will also test us at times because we won't always be able to control what happens. And here's another quote. To be self-sacrificial in partnership is to understand that we will not always own, manage and control partnership projects, nor will we fully agree with those we work alongside. The enslaved Israelites certainly had good reason to find conflict with the Babylonians. And yet, God didn't excuse them from partnerships. But in my experience, when we enter into partnerships, just like the op shop volunteers, people tend to be a lot more cooperative than we sometimes give them credit to. I remember uh, when we started the community garden, so we, we had a committee that was composed of some people from the church and some people not from the church. Well, in all those years that we ran it, we didn't have any great disputes. Yes, as a committee, we sometimes uh, kind of disagreed, but we didn't disagree about values. You know, there was never, never ever that sort of issue of, oh, this is what we believe in the church and this is what we believe. It was, wasn't a, a, that. It was more sort of procedural, practical things. 
we might have not all seen eye to eye to, but there was fantastic cooperation. It was a great experience. And uh, you can ask the other people on the committee and they would tell you that. There was another uh, example that I heard just during the week from Tony and Carol. It's just an example of the goodwill there is in the community. Tony and Carol, uh, as some of you know, Tim, their Tim has been in hospital for more than a week. Uh, he's still in a fairly serious uh, condition. But at the same time, their daughter Sarah uh, was in Ballarat Hospital having a, 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 a gallbladder operation. Tony and Carol have had an enormously difficult two weeks uh, with all that. But the doctor's um, clinic where they go to in Berlin got, got together and gave them a whole lot of groceries, all sorts of groceries. And when Carol went to thank them for it, they said to her, well, we, we do things as a team here. We believe that we, do th we want to do things together and we want to help you. And they might not have used the words, but in doing that, they blessed Carol and Tony's family. Isn't that fantastic? What a lot of goodwill. God is calling us individually and corporately to seek the welfare of our city as we move out of COVID. The next uh, interview you're going to see is from uh, Pastor John O'Ingram. Uh, and he just works... Um, about 15 minutes away at Rockbank in a new development called Aintree and we're going to hear from him uh, about what he does and how he, we hope to partner with him in the future. Uh, hi Jono, well thank you for joining us uh, today and uh, answering a few questions. And, no worries, um, Jeremy. Yeah, so uh, your uh, uh, most most of the people would not remember that you came and talked to our church about actually about a, a, a year ago mm. um, and you are, are only 15 minutes down the road from us uh, in what most people would know as rock bank but um, uh, at the entry community so you're a baptist you're a pastor in the in the baptist churches but you're not working as a pastor so what are you doing there I'm doing one day a week with the Baptist Union of Victoria as a uh, as a consultant um, and trainer. So I'm uh, uh, writing some training and doing some consulting in placemaking, community development, social enterprise, and kingdom business. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be doing that one day a week, and then I basically do all of those things myself in my own neighbourhood. Um, the the other the other days. So I founded a uh, a non-profit organization called We Love Aintree. And so we're a non-profit, community development non-profit, uh, which is about place-based community development that empowers local people to create places of connection and belonging. And so um, we run community events and programs and initiatives that help empower people to uh, be neighborly and to um, uh, be part of the community and, and, and include everybody in the community and be welcoming and then we run two social enterprises as well so we run a, uh, a community cafe and we also run a uh, a gardening uh, vegetable gardening construction uh, landscaping type social enterprise and both of those social enterprises uh, will uh, they're, they're in the verge of um, employing and uh, mentoring at-risk young people uh, I saw on one of your placemaker websites yep. um, a statement where you know you basically say you work with other organisations to um, uh, to build partnerships um, and cultivate flourishing communities. So, mm. what why do you think that's so important? What what you're trying to do through placemaking? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so the partnerships that, that we're developing or that we're working on here is particularly with the land developer yeah. uh, in our neighbourhood and then with the wider city of Melton. And so those partnerships are, are strong enough for us that they're actually, both of those organisations have uh, opted in to, to uh, put some financial backing behind the non-profit that I run for the next three years. 
Yeah. Um, so, so both, and they've been doing that for the past three years as well. So that'll make six years total that both of those organizations would have, would have done that. And, um, so those partnerships are, um, are crucial for, for some of that resourcing and support, I guess, from a really, yeah. really practical point of view. Yeah. Um, but also they're kind of known organizations for our wider community uh, yeah. who, who, where they are involved in, in, uh, in doing things in our neighborhood and, and we can uh, join in with, with what's going on there or, or add value to some of that. Yeah. What do you see happening to communi communities as a result of stuff like this? I don't know, maybe one example comes to mind or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think that, uh, I think that when, when we've seen, we've been able to partner with, say, the, um, the city of Melton, um, because of the, because of their ability to, um, to be in the community and be a known uh, organisation in the community, obviously it's, a, it's the local council, um, we've been able to get a, a, a quick, build a quick reputation with our neighbourhood uh, yeah. to be able to, um, to, to do some really good things and, and become trusted. So um, yeah. one of the really good things that we were able to do partnering with the city of Melton was after some uh, not so good things that happened in our neighbourhood around safety and security, uh, we hosted a, a community meeting uh, where with where we're straight away because of our connections with council, we we're able to link in with some people in council, um, Victoria Police, Neighbourhood Watch, and they all meet and convene. Uh, in our neighbourhood, and we saw around 300 people from our neighbourhood come to this community meeting. And the Victoria Police said that normally they would only get about 10 to a wow. meeting like this. Fantastic. Um, and so yeah. a lot of that, I think, was was due to that being able to have that partnership, find those resources, build that reputation in the neighbourhood ourselves as well. Uh, where if the council had to just run it on their own, they might not have got the community input. And if we yeah. had to just run it without the support of council, we may yeah. not have had the impact. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a really good example, actually. Um, but, jo Jono, we, we're quite excited about the possibility, um, uh, and we'll, we'll probably we'll know this in the next month, of actually working with um, Eat, Grow, Garden, which is one of your uh, projects, um, and, and yeah. working actually... Uh, connected to our own community garden here at Bacchus Marsh. Um, so yeah, we're looking mm. forward to that and we, we're possibly going to have more contact in the future, which is great. Um, but for, for churches, you know, if, if our church actually partners with yourselves as a community organisation and then obviously has more connection with communities here, how do you think um, that would be, how would be benefit a church, whether it's our church or churches in general. Yeah, look, I, I think that churches partnering with organisations outside of the church, and, and we're an interesting organisation because we're made up predominantly, well, it, most of our leadership is, in fact, no, all of our leadership are Christians uh, yeah. and, uh, and Baptists. Um, but, but we have some input outside of the church as well in our organisation. Uh, and, but the when churches work with other organisations, partner with other organisations outside of the church, they begin to realise or or are able to see more clearly the reality that God's at work outside of the church, um, yeah. that he's, he's at work inside the church, but he's actually already doing stuff outside of the church uh, through people who may not even be people of faith. And so I think what partnership does is that it teaches us as followers of Jesus to trust in uh, God's activity in the world, yeah. that God is actually active in the world without us, yeah. um, that he doesn't need us, but he chooses to partner with us. And yeah. so partnerships take things out of our control yeah. and force us to have humility, I guess, uh, relying on the gifts, gifts of others and pot mm. potentially even people who don't believe the things that we believe. Um, but, but they have gifts that are, that are active in kingdom work. Um, 
And so we don't not only have to have humility to, to rely and trust on them, but therefore we've got this humility to trust more fully on God, that, yeah. that God knows what he's doing yeah. uh, and that he's doing stuff and he's yeah. inviting us to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really uh, great answer and a good note to end, uh, Jono. So thanks very much for speaking to us today. Jono made a good point at the end. God is at work in people's lives, the people that you and I have to do with. God is at work in the good things that are happening in our communities. God is at work even in the midst of difficult circumstances, just like his people in exile in Babylon. I had a, I had a really great example from someone from our church during the week of God working in the life of someone who my understanding is they don't have uh, faith in the sense that we would know faith this is a situation and and i've got permission to share this i'm, I'm not telling you any names here's a situation where a family member was out of touch with another family member so this is not the church person this is someone from their family and they said to me that this family member heard God's voice say to her that she should write a letter to the person that she is out of touch with. And um, when I last heard about it, she was about to do that. He was, uh, he's been praying for this situation and he knows that God has something to do with it. But isn't it great? God is at work in people's lives. Um, and the Spirit of God is at work and we need to trust that as we work in partnerships. May we be alert to that Spirit as we continue to partner with God's gracious plans for our world.